My name is Brett Sackett with Pasco Scientific, and today we're going to talk about measuring solar eclipses with sensors. And so whether you're going to be in the path of totality on April 8th, or you're somewhere outside of that, sensors are a great, great way to explore the eclipse, make great measurements, and have amazing conversations with your students about this phenomenal event. So we do have another webinar that we did previously with um, Roger, and so we will make that available to you after this event. We'll, we'll have a card up at the top and we'll send an email to you that contains that information. That webinar was about teaching about the eclipse and, and about the phenomena, how you would go about doing lessons with it. But today, it's all about sensors. On the PASCO website, if you go to pasco.com forward slash eclipse, we have a lot of resources for you. We have a DIY handbook, which is if you wanna make your own uh, pinhole camera, we have instructions for that. We have uh, activities on using sensors. So if you wanna hand out a lab activity to your students, we've made those available. Um, also, there's just other information about eclipses like eclipse safety, which is very important. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit about eclipse history, and we even have some blog articles about pet safety during the eclipse. So all those resources are available at pasco.com forward slash eclipse. All right, so I'm sure you're here because on April 8th, there is going to be an amazing total solar eclipse going across the United States. And so what I'm showing here, this is the path that the path of totality will take across the United States. And so if you're lucky enough to be there, it's going to be an amazing event. And we wanna make sure that if you're making measurements with sensors, that you're going to get the best measurements possible. Because measuring a, an eclipse, it's, you know, it's not as simple as just going out and throwing some sensors out there and collecting data. There's some tips and tricks, and I'm going to share that with you so that you can be successful and have great data with your students. So, safety first. Um, eclipse glasses are super important, and not only um, do you want to make sure that you have some eclipse glasses, you want to make sure that they're certified. So I have a screenshot there of how you can tell if it's actually certified on the inside arm of the eclipse glasses. Make sure you have quality glasses so that your eyes are protected. In 2017, there were news reports of some eclipse glasses that were in the market that were not providing good protection. So, you know, we make sure that we provide the best protection possible for your eyes. So, next step, check the weather. So, I hope wherever you are, you have great weather to observe the eclipse. Uh, this map that I'm showing here is not a weather forecast. It is a statistical average of what cloud cover looks like on April 8th. So take that for what it is, but it kind of gives you an idea of the probability of cloud cover. But I hope wherever you are, you have a, <clears throat> a great view of the eclipse. But check the weather, check the surroundings, because wherever you are, you want to be unobstructed. You want to be a, in a clear area where... Uh, trees won't be blocking your measurements, where buildings won't be blocking your measurements. Um, and I'll be talking about how you prepare for making your measurements with those kinds of considerations in mind. So have your spot kind of thought ahead. All right, so during an eclipse, what can we measure? Well, we can measure changes in light level, changes in temperature, and changes in wind speed and direction. Those are three things that are very interesting to measure and investigate during an eclipse. And I'm gonna talk about each of those and what are the best tools to measure those with. So things that you'll need are a, a light sensor, a temperature sensor, and I'll talk about each of these in a little more detail, but you want, a, you want a, a way to measure changes in light level. The light level is gonna change, so we're gonna quantify that with a measurement. As the sun gets blocked, the temperature drops. How much does it drop? Well, you can find out by using a temperature sensor and making that measurement. Then we have this right here, which is the PASCO wireless weather sensor. This is an all-in-one. It measures 
19 different things. It's amazing. It has built-in GPS, but it's also going to give you light level measurements. It's going to give you temperature, humidity, dew point, wind speed, and direction. So it's an all-in-one solution. All right. So what I've prepared for you here is a checklist of things you might want to think about pulling together for April 8th. What do you need first? Sensors. So you want you know, some light sensors, temperature sensors, or a weather sensor. You want to make sure you have software installed. So the software we have is uh, SparkView and Pasco Capstone, and either of those would be great for measuring the eclipse with the sensors. Um, you'll need a computer or a, a device like an, an iPhone, iPad, Android. All those can run SparkView and you can collect data with those. Um, a pop-up tent is handy because you are going to be out in the sun and so you want to be protected. And so if you have a laptop, sometimes having that underneath the tent so you can read it nice while your sensors are outside of the tent making measurements. Uh, tripods are handy. You can see I've mounted the weather sensor to a tripod here. I've mounted this wireless light sensor to this tripod. And the tripods are handy because they allow you to orient the sensor however you need it to be oriented. And it also holds the sensor steady during the eclipse so you get a stable measurement. Um, I've also put on this list a reflective board, which is this sort of DIY product or project I put together here. I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. And then phone apps. There's apps you can get for your phone that will help you during the eclipse. Uh, a compass is going to be handy, and also you can get uh, apps that give you a celestial map so you can see a projection of the sun and the moon and constellations and everything through your phone, and those are super handy. And then I also put on here gaff tape. Just being able to tape things down is important. If it's going to be in a windy area or wherever you're going to put your sensors, uh, securing them so that they're stable is very helpful. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about is this app. Um, this is what's on my phone. I'm sure there are other apps out there. You might know a better one. If you do, let me know. <laughs> um, but this one is called Solar Walk 2. And so this app uses your, your phone and your camera so that as you're looking through it, you can see the celestial sphere. You can see where the planets are, where the sun is. And so you can't really see my phone right now, but what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the ecliptic. Now the ecliptic is the great circle around the celestial sphere, and that's what our the you know, that's the path that the planets and the sun go around us in. And so as I move my phone around, I can see what's happening in the sky. Like I can see the sun is in this direction. And if I keep going a little bit, I can spot the moon over here. And so, so that's very helpful. And so I definitely recommend getting an app so you can know in advance where the ecliptic is, because that's gonna be the path that the sun and the moon are gonna follow when they have, when the event happens. So super handy. Um, this is an example of during 2017, this is, this is about to be a partial eclipse. I'm looking through my uh, camera here and I can see there's the sun and there's the moon approaching and it's coming through and it's gonna make a partial eclipse. That was in 2017. I'll go back up one slide. Uh, the American flag there, that, that's this morning at Pasco. I took a screenshot just to demonstrate to you how this app works. I've pointed towards the sun and that's where the sun was at that time. And it's projecting where these stars and, and things in the heavens are at that moment. So let me talk about light sensors. You want to measure the change in light. And there's different kinds of light sensors out there. And you want to know, well, how am I going to use these? And how you use them is different depending on the kind of sensor. So I'm, I've split this up into spot sensors and ambient light sensor. And so a spot sensor is going to be some sort of light sensor, but what sets it apart is it has what I'll call a snout. So these sensors on the front of them have, have this snout, and that's where the light sensors are. And so as light comes in through the front of the sensor, it's measuring the intensity of the light, 
Um, our, our newer light sensors give us red, green, and blue measurements. And um, so what's important to understand about the spot sensors is that they're very sensitive. And because of that, if you take that sensor and point it to the sun, it's just going to blow out the sensor. It's going to peg the readings and all you're going to see is a flat line. So for the spot sensors, you need to measure something other than pointing directly at the sun. And I'll talk about that. Now on the flip side of this sensor is another kind of sensor that's called an ambient sensor. It has a dome over it. And what that does is this allows the, this sensor right here to be pointed directly at the sun. So this is a great sensor for measuring the solar eclipse directly because you can point this right at the sun. The weather sensor here has the same kind of ambient light sensor and it's at the top of the weather sensor. So you can't really see it because I have it mounted to this tripod here, but it has it included there. So um, let me talk a moment about sampling rates. You or your students are gonna set up the sensors for data collection and you can vary the sampling rate on a sensor. And that's a good conversation to have with your students, especially if you're having them design their own experiments using sensors. What is an appropriate sampling rate? And so for things that are moving fast, you want higher sampling rates. For uh, events and phenomena that happen slowly, slower sampling rates are sometimes the right sampling rate. So for the eclipse, you could set it at one sample a second, or we call that one hertz, and you will get great data. If you want to turn up the sampling rate, maybe to around five or 10 samples a second, you're going to get just more data points and you'll see more variability in between those changes in data. Like for instance, if a, a cloud or a bird flies by, you'll probably see it with a faster sampling rate. But somewhere in there, you're going to get great data. So how to measure the eclipse with a spot sensor. So how the spot sensor works is because we don't want to point it directly at the sun, we need to point it at something else and measure the reflection, measure the light reflection during the eclipse. And that's what I have here. I DIY'd this. And all this is, it's just some poster board. It could be a piece of paper, uh, just something white and probably a matte finish so that you can have the uh, the spot sensor pointed at this. All I've done is I have, this is just a, it's an angled uh, paper holder. So if you wanna, if you have, you can slide a piece of paper in there and so people can read it. So like as a display, I just took one of those and took some tape and taped it against a plat, I, this is just more um, poster board here. So I taped it to that, uh, it's, at a, it's at a nice angle. Because um, you want this, if the sun is right there, you want the sun aiming down here, and then the light sensor is going to measure the change in reflected light from the poster board. So <clears throat> this kind of a setup, easy to make, you're going to get great data. Things to think about, though, is stability. When you do this, you want to make sure that one, there's no shadows from a nearby tree or people walking by that are going to get in the way of the sun. So if you have this set up, it's better to uh, elevate it. Um, if you're near a car, having it on top of your car works great. Just tape it down with some gaff tape to make sure that it's stable. Um, you know, winds will start shifting this around. So that's why I recommend the gaff tape, to tape things down. And then with the ambient sensors, they can just be pointed directly at the sun or in another direction, and you'll get great measurements. Just be aware, if someone walks in front of this, you're gonna see a dip in your data while someone got in the way of your data. So just kind of always be aware of your, your surroundings, who's where, and if people are walking around, try and get your, your sensor elevated to where you'll get a clean measurement. Um, so this right here is back in 2017, I made some measurements and these are, I'm using the ambient light sensor on both of these wireless light sensors. 
And you'll notice I have them in different directions because uh, one is directly towards the, the sun where the eclipse is happening. And the other one is directed towards Polaris. <clears throat> and so let me talk about that for a moment. Be, let's you know think about it like this is if you are pointing your light sensor at the sun, the sun is constantly moving. The moon is constantly moving. And if you're, uh, because we're not like all set up with a tracking system to track with the sun, you know, the there's going to be just an aggregate change in the measurement over time because the sun relative to the sensor is changing its position. And you can see that in the data. Um, you know, it's it doesn't affect the data to where, oh, kids can't learn science, right? It's not going to give you bad data. It's just be aware that the sun is moving. And so the, you know, the total sun available sunlight into the sensor changes. Now, one thing you can try, which I did previously, is you can point the sensor towards the celestial pole. And so it's, like I said, it's not necessary. You'll get great data whether you're pointing it towards the celestial pole or directly at the sun. All, you know, it's, it's all good data. But it's interesting to think about, and this is why I said this is like extra credit time. So if, let's geek out on this for a moment. Um, I know in, in this room, because the other app that's kind of handy is your compass. So if you go to your compass app and you say, where's north? And I know north is over here. So if you go north and start from the start from the horizon and go up the same degrees as your latitude, you will be pointing at the celestial pole. And so if you want to point your ambient light sensor right there, you can totally do that. So if I go to that app that shows me, okay, there's I can see there's the horizon. So I can look at this and it shows me where the horizon is and I know I'm pointed north, and I start tipping this up, if I go up from where I am here at Pasco, we're at 38.8 degrees latitude, and if, so if I go up 38.8 degrees latitude, I will be pointing at the celestial pole. Um, and you'll find, using this app, it's really close to Polaris. So if you get it kind of in the direction of Polaris, you'll pretty much be there. Um, if you have super fancy, um, equipment that can get your angle correct, you'll get maybe some better data. But so what it does is why, why is that work? Why is it a thing? It's because remember I said, well, the sun was over here and it's orbiting on the, um, uh, the ecliptic. Well, the, if I go here towards Polaris, the, um, it's the, it's the direction where the sun will keep a constant angular distance from the direction of my light sensor. So you can kind of think of it as it's statistically normalizing the light data, assuming there's no clouds, <laughs> okay? All right, so, so that was our extra credit, sort of geek out about the uh, celestial pole. Um, again, it's not necessary, but you know, it's, it's interesting, and I'll show my data from that in a moment. Let's talk about measuring temperature. Super important. You definitely, if you're measuring light, man, you really want to measure the change in temperature because the temperature definitely drops. Even in a partial eclipse, if the sun is being blocked, you're going you're gonna to measure a change. But I need you to be very careful with how you're going to measure temperature. And one, you want that temperature sensor in the shade. You want it in the shade because you want to measure the air molecules that are in the environment around you, in your microclimate, and you want to know what the ambient temperature is and is that dropping? Can you measure that drop? So keep your temperature sensors in the shade. What happens if you don't? Well, physics happens. <laughs> so um, the, the probes like these temperature probes that have a a steel probe, they're metal. And so if there's sunlight directly on that metal, metal likes some photons. So it starts absorbing photons and the photons coming into it heat up the metal. And so instead of measuring 
the molecules bouncing off the, the probe, you're now measuring molecules bouncing off the probe and photons being absorbed into the metal. So you're measuring technically something other than the ambient temperatures. Uh, and the other situation here is a temperature sensor lying on a metal bleacher. Same kind of thing. You've got the temperature sensor absorbing photons. You have the metal bleacher absorbing photons and radiating. And so that's going to get super hot. So best temperature measurements are in the shade. Um, remember I talked about having that pop-up tent? Have the temperature sensor in under the pop-up tent, under a tree, or make yourself a little DIY shade thing, maybe behind here. <laughs> and um, keep, keep it shaded so you're, you're after the ambient temperature sensor, temperature measurement. Okay, super important to get quality temperature readings. Um, now let's talk about the eclipse wind. So this is definitely a thing that happens. So when the sun gets blocked, it changes things here on Earth. And so the nice thing about the, uh, the wireless weather sensor is that it has everything we need to measure all the stuff. So we can measure light, amb ambient, temperature, wind speed, wind direction, and more, including GPS. Um, so let me kind of talk about why this is super fun. If, and, and the eclipse wind is a phenomenon that happens in the path of totality. So if you're outside the path of totality, uh, you're, you're not really going to experience this or you know, to the degree that the people that are in the path of totality are. So think of it as, as the path, the shadow of the moon is traversing across the United States here. It is creating a cooling band across the ground. So there's, there's a cool area, and then outside that area, it is still getting sun, so more sun, so it's warmer, and it creates a temperature gradient. And so that temperature differential causes wind to push into the cooling band region. And so what people experience is an increase in wind speed. And that's why this sensor here with the built-in anemometer is very cool, is that the wind's gonna pick up and, and you can measure that and measure the direction that the wind is coming in. So um, if you're in the path of totality, um, if you don't have a weather sensor, just kind of finger to the wind, <laughs> see, if, see if it's happening, but it should definitely happen. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Um, so let's take a look at some actual data. So this is my data from uh, 2017, where uh, we here at PASCO, there was a partial solar eclipse, but a good one. And so a couple things I wanna point out here is that over towards the left, you can see that there's a dip in, in the data right there. And that definitely was a cloud that moved in front of the sun as it was heading towards the eclipse. And luckily it was a clear day for the most part that day, except for that one cloud, but I could see that one cloud and it showed up in the measurement. Um, but also, you know, just a great thing to do with your students, you know, have a notebook and write down observations because clouds are gonna affect your data and you wanna write those observations down to include it in a, in a write-up about the eclipse. So the blue line there is the sensor pointed directly at the sun. And you can see I, there was a 81% drop in light level. And then the, the red line there is the, um, is the ambient light sensor that was pointed towards Polaris. And you can see because it's not pointed at the sun, the light, the total aggregate light level is lower. The percentage change is lower, um, but, but that's, you can compare those two data, data sets and see how they compare. Um, below that, I have the change in temperature. And you notice the temperature data is a little more spiky, a little more random because winds blowing around, things are happening. But in this instance, you can see there was a, a two, you know, little over two degree Celsius drop during the eclipse. So that's some actual data that I took. Um, 
And this is extra credit. Are the two things related? The change in light level, the change in temperature? Well, um, plot them against each other. So it's really easy in the software to take one measurement and another measurement that you are originally looking at. Temperature versus time, light level versus time. We'll plot uh, temperature as a function of light level and say, hey, do these things correlate? And here you can see, looks like there's a pretty good relationship between the two. There's a little bit of a hysteresis. What would that be from? Well, if you think about it, when you block the light, that's an instant change, right? Sun, sorry, moon in front of the sun, it's an instant change that we, we can see and measure right away. The effect of that on the temperature is gonna lag a little bit, and that lag gives us this hysteresis here. And you can also see in the data there, you can see where the, where the bottom of the light is, the temperature drop is shifted over a little bit. It's a little bit out of phase. And, and that's a, a fun conversation to have also. Uh, let me bounce over here and I'm gonna go to my SparkView software. So right now, uh, this light sensor is connected right now. I can measure the ambient light sensor Illuminance there if I want to, but um, and it, it's pretty straightforward. So I what I'm going to do is I'm not going to use um, that sensor. I want to use my wireless weather sensor just to kind of give you an idea because um, something that you know, I want you to think about is preparing for the eclipse. It's you know if you if you're heading out to measure it and you haven't really practice with the sensors or thought about how you're going to set things up. Everything we're doing here can be done without the eclipse days in advance. So get really comfortable with the software, how you're going to set things up on tripods, or if you're going to have your reflective board, you can use this even without an eclipse just to practice and make sure you're going to get the best measurements possible. So I'm going to come here and instead of that light sensor that was connected, I'm gonna connect my, my weather sensor up. And you see when I connect the weather sensor, all these measurements appear. It has a lot of measurements. And so we can get temperature, uh, we can get wind speed, we can get, let, let's get illuminance. Um, you can also turn on GPS and get GPS coordinates, but you know, for, you're probably staying still, so, and, you probably don't need to measure continuous GPS changes. Um, and then our compass here, we can get wind direction. So there's a lot of different measurements we can get. And so um, how are we gonna display those? Well, we can look at them in a graph, okay? And if I start collecting some data here, these things are gonna start um, collecting. I'll give the anemometer a quick blow just so we can kind of see the data there. The other thing you can do in SparkView, and this is what I, I want you to think about, is how do you want to display the data? Um, the, another consideration is our sensors, our wireless sensors, do remote logging. You could set this up to do remote logging and download the data later. I would recommend for this eclipse, don't do that. Watch the data in real time because you it, it's a lot more fun to watch the, you know, watch the data along with the, the eclipse and watch it happening. Um, I can build a new page. And so if I come here to this plus, I'll build a new page. And in SparkView, it gives you the ability to choose different layouts. And because I have so many measurements, um, let's say I wanna do four measurements and here I want digits displays. So, so let's say here I want temperature. I'm gonna have a digits display here. And let's say that's going to be wind speed. And then this digit display here, you know, super easy. I'm just collecting the display, telling it I want digits. And then the zoom windows are in my way. All right. So then I want um, illuminance. And then what do I want here? Um, wind direction. All right. I'm going to go back to collecting some data. So now my file has digits displays. I'll blow that anemometer again. Okay, 
five miles per hour. And then I can go back and I can look at, I can toggle between these two pages and I can see real-time graphs and then uh, real-time digits displays of the temperature. It's a little warm in here because of all the lights you can see <laughs> and, and light level. Um, so, you know, think about that, how you want to arrange your data so that you and your students can watch the data while you're observing the eclipse and you're recording that data for analysis and lab reports later. And all these things you could do in Capstone as well. So, and, th and that's kind of my, my big message here is practice in advance. It, you know, this, the, the eclipse is, you can't repeat it. Right, it's happening in real time, it's gonna go, and once it's done, it's gone. So practice in advance for how you're gonna configure your software, what displays you're gonna do. Do test runs, take your equipment outside, set it up in your backyard, or if you, can, if you know where you're gonna be, set it up there. Have an idea where trees are gonna be. Make sure people aren't walking in front of your sensors. Um, Set up your configuration files in advance so they're good to go. Um, if you're not sure about how to set up a configuration file, the Pasco activities at pasco.com forward slash eclipse, uh, we have configuration files with those activities and they'll be preset for you. Um, use the app like I talked about to find out, okay, where's the ecliptic gonna be? And you know where do I need to have my sensors set up or if I'm using a fiber optic cable, what, where's that gonna be? So test your setup, make measurements, collect data ahead of time, and go out feeling confident that like you're ready to get all this equipment going and make a lot of measurements, or that you've done this with your students ahead of time, like they're good to go. And just, you know, all the preparation you do is gonna make sure that you have a successful eclipse and collect data with sensors. So, you know, if, if you're out collecting some awesome data, we'd love to see it. Uh, we've put together Pasco Eclipse and a Pasco Eclipse team. And so we have, we're working with schools and educators out there that want to share their data with us and their photos. If you have your students wearing Eclipse glasses with sensors collecting data, we'd love for you to share that with us. You can contact me. My name is Brett Sackett. My email is sackett at pasco.com, S-A-C-K-E-T-T. -T. Uh, get in contact with us and we'd love to share what you're doing uh, on, on our social media and we'll have um, probably some blog posts after all this as well. Okay, well, thanks for joining our webinar on using sensors for how to measure an eclipse. Um, I hope you all have great success with your measurements and uh, if you have any questions, email me. Thanks a lot.